I finally made it. I'm going live. Come hell or high water, we are going to get our last live episode of our October call to prayer for our children's identity. So um, I'm going to just open in prayer. I tried to tag as many as I could, but it was kind of my... Um, I don't think it even allowed me. My phone's being weird. So some of you may get this later. I'm not quite sure. Anywho, um, I'm just going to pray real quick. And then I'm going to jump into our last message. I feel like this was a big one. I woke up with it heavy on my heart. Um, I thought I was going to go in a different direction today. But the Lord said, nope, this is where you're going. And so um, just join me in prayer if you would, please. Lord, I just thank you for... Um, this incredible month that we have had to contend and fight for our children's identity. I thank you, Lord God, that we are not ill-equipped. We're not empty-handed. We're not women who are damsels in distress, but we are anointed, we are appointed, we are called, we are equipped, we are authorized to not only fight for our children and contend for their future, Lord God, we are standing between hell and their future, Lord. I thank you, God, that you've given us the um, strength, the ability, the, the gifting, the desire, and um, Father, even the stamina to go the long haul for our children's future, our children's freedom, their victory, Lord God, their um, deliverance. Some need deliverance now, Lord Jesus. Some need to be called back out of the world and into the flock. Lord Jesus, and we are standing um, together as mothers, linking arms and, and declaring that our children will be mighty upon this earth. We surrender this time to you, Lord God, and we ask now that you um, have your way. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Um, hi, Beverly. Thanks for joining. Um, so today, I am going to teach about what, and this is what the Lord put on my heart, when our children's actions and choices hurt us, we've been there, we need to speak to their future and pull it into their now. And the first person that I thought of in this, um, in this scenario was the woman who went to Jesus and begged for him to deliver and heal her child. And she was not a Jewish woman. And Jesus looked at her and said, I don't you're asking me to take from my children and give it to the dogs. What that meant was Jesus was saying, this is not your promise right now. This is a future promise. But this woman was bold enough to say, I want the inheritance that comes after your death. And I want it now. I want my child's liberty and healing now. And so her being able to have that boldness and courage to go to the king of kings recognize who he is and not folded in just yet it wasn't her future yet she was not part of the gentiles promise yet jesus came for the jewish people but there was a promise for her in the future and she says i'll take it now please I'll take that deliverance now. I'll take that promise for my child now. I'll take the crumbs that come before the promise. I'll take anything you've got for me now, Jesus. Just get, get my daughter better. Man, I can relate to that desperation and that heart cry that says, whatever it takes, God, get my child under your will, under your protection, under your covering. Keep them at perfect peace. Whatever it is that they are in at this moment, Father, I, I need you to guard them with angels. Put a bloodline between them and the enemy that is after them. And if you are fighting for your child right now and you're fighting for their very deliverance, their very soul, maybe you're fighting for their future, they could be godly kids that are just up against it with some pretty hard pressures. Maybe they're a child that's in rebellion. Maybe you aren't on speaking terms. I don't know what it is that is robbing you of relationship right now or robbing you of peace because you are in knots over where your kid is at, where your child or grandchild, somebody that you love. It could be a husband or sister or mother who, who it is that the enemy is hard after. Today, we are going to not only contend for their victory and their future, but I want, to, I want us to draw from some women in the Bible who who showed us what it meant to pull our bootstraps up and trust 
trust the King of Kings in the hardest, most messiest moments of your life and your children's lives. There are some times in my life I can remember breaking my parents' heart. I remember breaking their hearts. I eloped at 18. Oh, that crushed my father. It crushed him in such a way when I came back from eloping, I went to his bedside and I said, Daddy, I'm married. And he just wept. And I will tell you, that broke my heart knowing I broke his heart. But I was too stubborn at any any way, shape, or form. I was better to ask for forgiveness than permission at that point. And that was that rebellious heart in me. But my parents warred, prayed, and prophesied. And they carried me through some pretty messy years. My, my elopement and everything that turned into a pretty messy, hard marriage in the beginning that ended up in divorce and then reconciliation my parents carried it in prayer. They physically did a lot of work for me. Thank you, Mama. But there was times that I know that their, their prayers were what were holding me together or holding my life together, holding my children's lives together. They were involved and they were in it to win it. They were in the trenches in prayer. And if they couldn't be in it physically, they were belly crawling in the mud for my salvation, my children's salvation, and my future. And that's what we're going to learn today. The belly crawl in the mud. I'm going to get to you later. Our children need us to be willing to get into the messy part of prayer. That praying, that fasting, that mouth shut, knees bent, hands folded. Don't even let them see the expression on your face when they make a decision that you don't approve of. Because trust me, they're going to do it. And I'm going to give you an example of what the Lord showed me when I was praying over my son who was in rebellion in high school. My heart was broken. He was, he was crushing me. I felt like I was choking from his decisions. My chest was heavy and I'm not an angry person, but I felt a rage. This, this rage inside of me that was an unusual for me and my personality. And where it came from, was it a holy rage? Was it a rage at him? I don't know. But I can remember Holy Spirit telling me, Holly, you've got to love your kids with a hinged heart. And I had to think about that, what it meant to love our children. Somebody put it in there. Loving our kids with a hinged heart. You see, when we are all in with our children, we do. We love our, we love our kids wholeheartedly. But they will break our hearts. They will break our hearts with their decisions. They will break our hearts. They will betray us. They're going to just, sometimes we got to face it. Sometimes our kids are jerks and that's just the way life is. But if we can love our children with a hinged heart, that means when the weight of the world and the weight of their choices and the weight of their decisions come upon a mother's heart that is dedicated in prayer and love, when that happens and they make those decisions, a hinged heart won't. Hinged heart won't break. It will bend. It will go with the pressure that is coming against it. And one of the best pictures that I saw with a hinged heart was when we moved to Seattle and we saw the way these br the bridges up here have these giant hinges and joints that connect them to move with an earthquake. And I thought, what a beautiful picture of a hinged heart. It can carry the weight of, of the world. It can carry the weight of several Mack trucks and, and cars. And even when an earthquake comes, those hinges will do everything it can to move with the disruption without it breaking and actually crashing and losing everything that it was supposed to carry. Loving with a hinged heart means when our children are in these messy places and they're making decisions that crush us. Maybe they're betraying you right now. Maybe they're in drugs and you're not speaking to them. Maybe they're in a relationship that is causing them to withdraw from you or or whatever it is, it can get, there's just some really ugly things that happen in family and in, in the dynamics of when our children hurt our hearts. And when we love with a hinged heart, that means we can take that weight and be able to be flexible with it without it destroying us. It can't put us in a corner crying and just, woe is me. We are put on this earth with these children, these grandchildren, these people that God has put under our covering of prayer and assignment and authority. And we are here not only to war and contend for them, but we got we to gotta understand that's going to hurt. 
that's going to hurt us sometimes. Sometimes they're just going to, like us, we hurt our parents and, and decisions that we've made. And so sometimes that's going to happen with our children and grandchildren. They're going to break our hearts. And we've got to be willing to just take a breath and be hinged and understand that this moment will pass this isn't forever. The Lord is in it. And sometimes we don't get to see that victory and because maybe God takes us home before it happens. But if we believe in the promises of the Lord that says that our children will be mighty upon this earth, then we know that God is for us. God is for them. There are, God has no grandchildren. And the first woman that I was thinking about was Moses' mother. When she had to, and this is going to come at a shock, to all of us she had to not only put her child in a river that had predators the Nile has crocodiles put it in a place of predators she was also not knowing where what was going to happen with her child once her hands were off once her hands were off her her son's life she did not know what was going to happen but she and this is an infant I mean I can understand wanting to throw your teenager in a in a river full of crocodiles. Ha ha ha. But um bum But an infant we're put she is putting this baby in uh the, in the river and this little one is going to be rescued by their haters. This little one is going to be rescued by their persecutors. Not only is Moses going to be rescued by their their um by those who hold them captive. He's gonna be raised in an atmosphere that they've been trying to prevent being an influence on their life. Come on somebody, that's where we're at right now. We have a lot of children um, in the world right now that are not of the world and parents that are afraid of putting their kids in public school, parents that are afraid of letting their children um, be active in communities. We can't do that. We have to understand that, that, that these are our children are seeds and that we gotta protect, we've gotta equip, and we've gotta guard, but we can't tuck them away and put them in a cave and and hope that nothing ever ever comes their way that that we've got to teach them how to fight because that's what's out there and so Jochebed Moses's mother not only does she have this um it's it's either he dies he dies at home or he dies in the water but it's this moment where she's like I got to see what happens I got to risk it and of course we know the story the Lord puts Moses back in her arms to um, be a wet nurse but eventually, she um, has to release him again, and he is raised in the palace of her enemies. And I can't relate to that fully. I can, re I can relate to a piece of where um, I had a child who sided with somebody who was cruel and hated me. And I will tell you that broke my heart. It broke my heart that he was being deceived, and he is being manipulated, and he was being... Um, played like a fiddle but you know the lord was good and he took care of the situation it took a while but things surfaced and, and the same way it did with moses it surfaced for him and he saw the injustices look at this i'm glowing um it, he saw the injustices of maybe his rescuers were good to him for a time and it and it saved his life but it was going to backfire on the enemy and that is where we have to become so equipped for our children, so determined that we refuse, even if it looks like they are in the palace of the enemy and they are living their life as an enemy of God, an enemy of us, and they are living in the palace of the enemy. We refuse to release them to that part of their destiny. That is not their destiny. They are a child of God, bought and paid for by the blood of the lamb, and we are marking them every single day, reminding, reminding God and reminding the enemy that that, that is not your kid, and we're might reminding God that do not forget about my kid. He is going to be yours. She is going to be yours. He is going to 
preach, prophesy, or he's going to, he's going to, she's going to, whatever it is that the Lord has given you a word to say over your kid, that is what you're going to do over and over and over again. You see, we have a lot of women in the word of God that show us what we need to do when it comes to these messy moments and how to contend for our children and grandchildren for their future, for their, for their, not just their future, but for their children's future. We know that Hannah wept a gutted prayer over, over begging for a child and then letting go of that child. We, we've seen, could you imagine being Elizabeth and being promised a baby in your old age only for that baby to, to live as a wild person, a wild man and covered in camel hair. And I'm like, man, you prayed for that kid and he's nuts. You, this is the one you wanted really bad. You you see that he is he's crazier than a bag of cats. And Elizabeth, not only did she weep for this one and, and praise God for this one, but then she had to grieve and bury him. Because not only was her crazy son um, out living in the fields eating, eating bugs, he was beheaded. I can't even imagine. I've had children that have gone to war and we've had to face some pretty ugly realities just from that. But can we just can we just think of what it looks like when we are praying and fighting for our kids and their future and this messy trench moment of just saying, okay, God, I'm on my face. I am going to fight dragons. I'm going to slay some monsters for my children's soul. And I'm going to go after them. I'm going to go after that the enemy of their soul. And I'm going to stand between it. And our children, we don't see the fruit of it right away. We just sit and we know that we just fight, fight, fight. But I want to I want to encourage that grandmother heart, that mother heart, that we are fighting from a place of peace. We are fighting from a place of confidence. We want to draw from Jacobed's history to know that even if our son is in the palace of the enemy, he will come back with information against the enemy and he will expose the lie to his people and show them, look what I believed it. Don't believe it. Look at what I've been delivered from. We know that God will turn it around. Joseph is another great story that is somebody, even though he held fast to his faith, his father thought he was gone for good. These are just moments in the word of God that we learn how to live and love with a hinged heart without giving up on our kids. You see, we have these seeds of prayer that we are depositing in them as children, as, as our grandchildren. We are stuffing these seeds in their little fertile soil now. And if your child is away right now, if you have a kid, I don't know who you are, but if your son or daughter is out in the world and they are making some pretty messy decisions and it's affecting you, see, like people like to say it's their choices. But you know, their choices affect you. They hurt you. Your heart breaks. When, when our children break our hearts and make decisions that break our heart, it's not just their choices because we become casualties as well. We become mothers that feel this, the, um, the ripping and shredding of a child's decision. And so we have to come to this place. Not only do we have hinged hearts, we have bended knees. And we have to begin to prophesy the promise. We have to prophesy the promise that that the enemy does not get your kid. He does not get my grandkid. He does not get my husband. If there is addiction in your household and there is addiction or maybe you have a child that has fallen away from the Lord and they're in utter rebellion and maybe to the world they look like a great kid. To the world everything's fine but to you, you know that maybe in the world this is acceptable. Maybe in the world this is okay. But you know that that young person, that older person, that grandchild, that sister, brother, auntie, uncle, you know that that person has a call of God on their life. And what looks acceptable to the world says no. You say no. God has called you holy. God has set you apart, sanctified you, and called you up and called you out. So I say that now to you. You are called up and you are called out. You are set apart. You are sanctified. And you will walk in your identity, your God-ordained identity. Until you see it happen, sisters, that these are the things you have to do. You've got to prophesy it. You've got to pray it. You've got to declare it. But the last thing that you can do in all of this is come in agreement with a bittered soul, with a bittered heart, the way, the way Naomi became embittered and that she was so brokenhearted. Her husband made a decision that cost her family. Can you imagine that? 
Not only does she have all this mess inside of her, but she's, she doesn't have any place to put that bitterness. She can't even blame him for it. Not like Job's wife. Job's wife was like harping in his ear, curse God and die. Naomi did not have that option to even be mad at her husband. He, she couldn't even have a conversation. His decision cost her entire family. And she, had to, she wanted to become bitter in it. And we have to understand that we cannot become these embittered people because somebody made a decision that, that affected us. We have to become responsible over our hearts even when our families are making decisions that break them. We are responsible for walking in a, in, in a confidence in the Lord. Now, am I going to say that that's just rosy and peachy and you're going to feel good about it? Absolutely not. You're going to grieve. You're going to grieve. So good news. Yay. You're going to grieve certain moments, but then there's going to be a part when the joy of the Lord comes in and he is your strength. And you're going to realize that is not the future of this, that, or the other, that you are going to stand and you're going to contend. And so I, I feel like I'm speaking to somebody that you are, you've been crying in a full dependence upon the Lord and you've been begging in desperation, but today it needs to shift. And now you're going to stand. You're not going to stand as a desperate prayer warrior. You're going to stand as a confident watchman. Somebody put that in the chat. You are not a desperate prayer warrior. You are a confident watchman. Like Nehemiah, you've got a weapon in one hand and a tool in the other. And you, not only are you building things up in prayer, but you are slaying the dragons in the other hand. So this is, this is how we do it. When we loved with a hinge heart, whatever it is that is breaking your heart right now, that your child, your grandchild, husband, somebody is walking in an area that is crushing you and you are in the trenches and you're being walked on rather than, rather than feeling like you are being victorious. Sisters, we've got to shift our mindset. We got to shift our mindset and understand that we are not helpless even in the trenches. We are not helpless even when we're face down in the mud. We are not helpless when it comes to praying our children back into the hand and the will of God. We are not put in a position that says, well, I guess that's that. Kids are going to do what kids are going to do. We don't live in that place. We live in a position that says, well, the kids are going to try to do what they want to do, but God Almighty is going to interfere in their plans because they have been dedicated, set apart, sanctified, blood-bought, and they are anointed, appointed, and authorized to influence this world, not be influenced by this world. Amen? Amen. So we're going to take a page from Jochebed. Somebody say, I'm taking a page from Jochebed. I'm going to trust that even if my kid is in the palace of the enemy, he's going to shake that place up and he's going to set people free. And he's going to walk. Not only will he walk away from the palace of the enemy, but he's going to take two million of God's people with him to the promised land. Amen. Amen. We have Moses is being positioned now. We are living in a world that needs Moses is positioned now to be able to stand and even if we are fearful we do it afraid even if God is saying you don't understand my plans now like it tells us in the book of John in the latter days you'll understand my plan Whew, that's a hard one to walk out in the moment when you don't understand the plan because God is saying if you trust me if you trust me if you trust me do you trust me? If you trust me, you are going to see a fruit and a harvest you never would have saw if you just tucked your kid away and, and tried to keep him from anything that could hurt them. So here's what I want to leave you with. I want to leave you with the confidence of Jacobed. I want to leave you with the hope that comes with, with surrender and, and, and Jacobed's, um, unyielding heart to refuse the the unyielding heart to refuse that her son was going to be a residence an egyptian resident no he was not our children are not egyptian residents our children are heaven residents and they're going to go to egypt and they're going to pull whoever is in the in the the um, whips and in the in the shackles of the enemy and they're going to lead them out even if it looks like they're living there right now it is not their address and we're going to have the hope of 
of Jacobin. And you know what else we're gonna have? We're gonna have the peace of Elizabeth. Even if our kid right now looks like they are going off the deep end, we're gonna have the peace that God is with them, that God is speaking to them, that God is in the midst. We're gonna have that, that confidence of Deborah, that she was a confident mother and prophetess, that we know that we are gonna speak things into existence and we can rest against a palm tree knowing that we can war from rest and we can war in confidence that our children will be mighty on this earth and they will march out of Egypt and they will prophesy and proclaim and sing and we are going to see heaven's strategies, heaven's solution, heaven's resources while we stand in confident hope. The hands of heaven are heavily involved in our children's lives. Do you believe that? I believe that. I believe that the hand of the hands of heaven are heavily involved. And when we partner with prayer, we are just putting our prayers around the hands of heaven saying, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you with the most precious, valuable thing here on earth. And that is my blood, the, my heart that walks outside of me, my children, my grandchildren, my nieces, my nephews, my parents. We will not sit back idly and just say, Okay, Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. We will not do that. I will not do that, and I won't let you do that. We are contending for souls. This is eternity we're talking about. And so we are going to stand in confidence. And like I said, if it feels like your child is in the Nile, surrounded by crocodiles, that could have been a song right there. We have to understand that even if God sends the enemy to pull them out, he's only positioning our child to be a deliverer. He's not positioning our child to be raised and lost. God doesn't do that. He is positioning them to be equipped to lead and deliver. And I believe that we have a lot of Moseses out there and we are gonna to speak to that. We are gonna call on the heart of Moses in our children that if you're gonna go, if you're in the world right now, it's only because you're gathering intel to lead them out, amen? All right, let's just pray. Let's get to praying. If you have a child, if you have a granddaughter, grandson, uh, anybody that you are saying, I have a child that's living it up in the in the enemy's palace right now, we're going to pray with you. We're going to pray and agree with you that not only are they going to be delivered from that, but they're going to be so equipped that it's going to dismantle the enemy's um, army. It's going to, they will be overtaken. And so, we're going to pray against those ones that are in drug houses right now. Those who are um, living in sin, living with boyfriends and girlfriends and, and those who are making choices that are crushing you. Maybe they have turned their back on you and they're not speaking to you. Well, guess what? That there is no disownership. You can't unfamily somebody. So if you're feeling unfamily and disowned, that's just a lie from the enemy. Just because a child says, I don't want to have anything to do with you, doesn't mean your prayers are ineffective. The effective prayers of the righteous availeth much. And we believe that. We also know that the Lord is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So even if we have a son or daughter or grandchild or even family member that says, I... You're, you're not my mom, you're not my auntie, you're not my grandma, whatever it is, that's just hogwash. That's just, those are just empty words with zero authority. You can't unfamily somebody. What that means is that, that they're, they have a broken heart and we get to get in the trenches with our hinged heart and pray them into right standing with Jesus. So Lord, we bring our, our broken heart and we thank you God that not only are you repairing it to be flexible you are hinging it now Lord that we will not break under the pressures of our children's choices we will not break under the the weight of their sin Lord we are not meant to be broken by them Lord that we are meant that to get on our knees and even if we're crawling in the mud for them Lord Jesus we will not do it in a place that is shattered but we will do it in a place that is flexible and moving with you Lord, the way that a hinged bridge moves with an earthquake to save the people that are on the bridge. We will have a hinged heart that when the earthquake comes, Lord, and our children make decisions, if they're living an alternative lifestyle that has shook us up 
and we are so fearful. Lord, I bind fear now in Jesus' name. I rebuke a spirit of fear now. We will not fear hell. I refuse to fear hell for our children. Instead, I will say, hell, you can't have my kid. You can't have my son. You can't have my daughter. You can't have my grandchild. Hell, you can't have my husband. You can't have my mother, my father, my best friend. I am not going to be fearful of your tactics. I'm going to warn you that heaven is on to you and heaven knows your plan and heaven is after you. And I come with all the power of heaven behind me that says that my child will walk and everywhere that child walks, they will take ground for Jesus, that they will be mighty upon the earth, that their sons and daughters will prophesy, that we won't live in fear. It says not to fear we don't fear the enemy. We fear the one who is who can take our soul. Lord, we know that you are the one. You are the one that we should have utter fear over. And Lord, I am not going to be afraid of you in, in a way that causes me to not trust you. My fear, Lord, is that it's a holy fear that says you are so all-powerful that I know that my children need you. They desperately need you. So Lord, I send you. I send you to the palace now. I send you to the to the to the um the drug house. I thank you God that you are on assignment to the drug house. I thank you God you're on assignment to a drug house now that you are walking in. And the little one I just see a I see a young woman just in the sitting and she is in a miserable state. Father, you are walking in and you are linking and you are lifting. You are lifting her up and you're saying it's time to come home. It's time to come home. Brianna, it's time to come home now in Jesus' name. You don't live here. This is not your address. I am authorizing you and I am crowning you with heaven's crown and you are going to walk out of this and you're going to take those, you're going to take others with you into the promise. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for that. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Thank you, Jesus. Ladies, just agree with that word. Would you please agree with me on that word that God is going into it wherever that young person is sitting down and he is saying, this is not your address. This is not your address. You are, you are, I've allowed you to be here. I did not assign you here, but I am certainly going to use you here to bring people home. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that a magnet of holiness is around her and she is going to rise up now in Jesus' name. And it's shaken off of her. We call that to Kristen now in Jesus' name. Wherever she is now, she is going to wake up. Wake up, not, not in regret, but in, in remorse and in repentance. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are waking her up now in Jesus' name. That she is coming to a revelation knowledge that heaven is for her and not against her. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We call our children home that are that are that are have one foot in the world and one foot one foot in the church. Lord, we ask now that as they walk this line, that they begin to Feel the presence so heavy on the side that their foot is in with Jesus that they are drawn into the presence of you in Jesus' name. I thank you, God, that you do not throw away your children. Even those who are struggling with their identity now, those who are living a, an alternative lifestyle, those who are confused about if am I a girl or am I a boy, Father, you know their name. You knit them together and confusion is not of you. We bind every, every thought that rises up against your, your word over them. Every lying tongue that has tried to dismantle the truth of who they are. And Lord Jesus, now we release their, the word that says they are fearfully and wonderfully made. And they begin to rest in the truth. That they, that not only do you know their name, but Lord, that they know, they know their name. They know their name. They know their identity in you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. Ladies, um, I tried to tag everybody. If this is for somebody, tag them in it. Tag their, just give them a shout out in it. If you feel like this, somebody needs to hear this message, give them a little tag. I will download this on YouTube and try to get it um, out as a shareable message. But here's where we're at. Even though October is done and we are, um, the assignment of October is done, we are not done praying for our children. We know that we have been um, readied, 
we've been readied. God has pulled us to the front and, and he has said, get in the front lines because not only are we fighting for our children's identity and not only are we fighting for our grandchildren's future, we are crumbling the, the plans of hell. We are setting dynamite to the, um, to the enemy's traps now. So um, let's stay busy. Let's stay vigilant. Let's stay um, awake in prayer. And if God wakes you up with somebody on your heart to pray for them, just just lay them, lay them at the foot of the Lord. If he wakes you up in the middle of the night, don't wake up in fear in prayer. Wake up in authority. And just say, I call, whatever's going on in my son or daughter's life, I call them now to uh, um, under the covering of the blood. I put a waterfall of the blood of the lamb around them now that whatever the enemy is coming against them in, that they will not be influenced. They will not be, they will not be attracted to it and they will not be um, sabotaged by it in Jesus name. All right, sisters, Evie's waking up. So oh, we made it. I love you so much. Bye.